What's up, guys? Welcome to the Ask a Creator Economist podcast. I'm Ron. I'm joined again by Thomas and Jonas. This is episode three. If you guys want to catch previous episodes, head over to the website unify.podcast or unify.io slash podcast, and you can submit questions so that you can get your questions answered, or you can listen to past episodes and uh, get informed on the creator economy. That's pretty much what we're here for to help you guys. And um, I want to start this conversation with the Oscars. Did you guys catch the Oscars? Not no. really, at least not live. No. And I obviously caught some of the uh, award winners on Twitter, but not really in detail. Yeah, there's a bit of controversy. I also, I also have to admit, like I used to be a big movie guy back in back in my twenties, but I but I really don't watch a lot of movies nowadays. Uh, almost almost oh, none. Thomas. So. Well, I guess it's something between uh, uh, launching a company, having two babies, and so on and so on. But but my, my wife and I, we just started m movie night, which we did once. And we watched Top Gun. But not the new Top Gun, but the old Top Gun, because she had never watched it. So Nice. Are you guys going chronologically through the years? Cause... <laughs> or how's that, how's that one... looking? Uh, there is no plan yet. Let's see. Okay. But I also made well... a plan to watch the new Top Gun. I heard it's good. I still haven't managed. Yeah. I heard, so the reason I want to bring up the, the Oscars, I think it is topical to Alvin Joe's. Thomas, just to quickly comment on what you said. Um, as, you know, pseudo creator economists, I think movies kind of represent, you know, the creator economy. They represent art. They represent culture. They represent a lot of things that, you know, reflect people and reflect desires and stuff like that. And I think... Um, the Oscars was kind of controversial. So just to give some context, I mean, you guys aren't super familiar with the movies that won or with the Oscars. It's kind of more of like an American pop culture thing anyway. But basically a couple of movies dominated. They, they cleaned house. Um, one of which was called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Um, it's a, to sum it up, it's a movie about the multiverse. And the main character is this like Chinese laundromat owner, this, this woman and her family. And this movie came out around the same time that the, you know, huge Disney Doctor Strange multiverse movie came out. So it was literally like two parallel movies coming out at the same exact time. And, you know, looking back now, every, everything ever all at once has won like seven Oscars for what they were able to do on a fairly small budget. But it was a super quality movie, you know, as opposed to Disney, who who knows how much money they invested creating this movie, this this piece of CGI um, garbage, in my opinion. And it, I think it, it represents a bigger topic or a bigger concept of like, like where where our culture is going when, when it comes to content, the idea of like quality over quantity, the idea of like super niche creating something for a specific audience or creating something that can sell toys and reach the, the biggest audience possible. And so, yeah, maybe general. also uh, something we've talked about before, also uh, the aspect authenticity. I mean, yeah. I, I haven't seen either of either one of the movies, but if you know it's a smaller production, maybe there's some, some episodes throughout the movie where you feel, feel a bit closer to, yep, to this thing than to an abstract Disney thing that you've, seen over and over again i mean it's a similar style and yeah. by now maybe authenticity trumps uh, show and pure entertainment yeah and who can really yeah, identify I'd, I'd, that I'd well with so. Doctor strange well i can i i can just t tell you that uh, i'm now definitely interested in watching watching this movie because in parallel i go i googled here and and the ringer has like something about the winners and losers of the academy awards and what they write here is but even by the academy's new standards of open-mindedness everything everywhere all at once is a genuinely unprecedented best picture winner a genre bending indie film featuring multiverses a terrifying void in the form of a giant everything bagel fight scenes featuring but plucks and fanny packs and a raccoon controlling the body of a renowned chef i mean come on if that doesn't sound like a cool movie i don't know <laughs> i'm sold Should yeah we pause this recording for a second yeah let's, let's just do a watch guys. along yeah <laughs> 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 no, but so, so so as we're talking about 
movies. I, I'm curious, like, what do you guys think? Wh why has the cultural relevancy of movies shifted? Or, and or m maybe it hasn't shifted, but it's just the type of movies that are mostly produced, like, like all this IP-based Marvel movie stuff. Uh, that is that is now the main gig. May maybe it just dominates, and and that is why the the movies that could shape culture like, in the way they did in the nineties, early two thousands, no longer exist. What's what's your take on, on movies? Where are movies at? I would guess that one reason for the success of these Marvel series, where you get one movie and the next and the next, is apparently there's quite a lot of carryover from people that watch one movie and then kind of automatically watch the the follow-up or the next one regardless of quality i mean besides the two-minute trailer you don't have much of the movie beforehand anyways that you could rate it on so i guess that's one point simply it works it sells um and you don't have to get too creative I mean, if you know, yeah. hey, we can we can sign or we can get this storybook by this unknown guy or we can just uh, publish another Marvel movie uh, where we know yep, we definitely. make at least X, then, yeah, obviously. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that, yeah. I was going to say something similar, Jonas. Um, have you guys seen the movie Nope? Nope. nope. It came out not too long ago. So it's, I, I'm sorry if I'm butchering this, but um, Key and Peel. One part of Key, of Key and Peele is um, Jordan Peele, I believe. I, I hope I'm not messing up those names. But he directed the movie uh, Nope. He directed Get Out. So he's been directing a, a, a couple of, like, I guess, like, horror films, right? And, and in this movie, the theme of this movie, Nope, was um, the idea that we are obsessed with spectacle. And it's essentially a movie where this this uh this rancher on a farm they get visited by aliens the alien uh, it, it's 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 a spaceship but it's actually a bio organism i don't want to root, spoil anything and basically when you look up at it it kills you and and the, like the, the theme behind the movie is that like we are obsessed with spectacle and there's this other farmer who then tries to monetize it and it, it's really like a play on spectacle and i think that is kind of like you know that's a all of his movies are essentially the commentary on society. And I think like Jonas pair that with the fact that they want to make the most amount of money as possible. And the fact that people are obsessed with spectacle. That's why people are obsessed with these Marvel movies, which is just CGI. It's just like dog shit dialogue. It's just the same template hero's journey, like copy pasted with a different character, maybe a little more diverse each time. And I think that's like, they know that that's what sells. They know that that's what people will buy. Yeah, and I guess That's those are my like movie production is driven more by numbers than by like a passion for yeah. movie making. Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Not the art that of it. Not some people that will care probably, but yeah. Still. I think well, I think the people that do care, the aficionados, like I have to consider myself an aficionado of movies. I just I, I love a good movie. Um and it's such a small segment of people, I would assume. I think they crunch the numbers. They know that if they're going to create movies, like you want to try to hit, you know, the other 80% of people who just want to go for a good time, get a nice popcorn, you know, get get some candy, get some, get a, get a soda with their family, sit back, watch a movie where they can turn their brain off. I think that's the market. Yeah. Thomas, you asked the question. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think again, like like the the for me the felt cultural relevancy of movies has definitely dipped. But I, I also believe you you cannot, for instance, underestimate the influence of series. And like like this form, it has become so much more relevant. And I think even many good writers, if you have a story to tell, then then having this long form format available rather than than compressing it into 90 or i guess today most movies are 120 plus minutes but still it is it is definitely also a factor because the cultural relevancy of series and tv shows is so so big nowadays and and some of the talent certainly has swayed toward to what's going there and you have these great productions there it's also quite cinematic what is being produced especially in the era so now we are probably a bit post the peak because now netflix and all these streaming companies are struggling with their uh, uh, 
with revenues because it seems streaming isn't that great of a business model after all. But but still, at the peak, so much creative work was financed, and and the Netflix approach is also quite famous. You no, know, where they say, look, you're the talent. I give you a bunch of millions do it and I will not talk with you about the creative, about the content. I guess these times are changing now as well, but but that might also play a role. Let's uh, yeah. hop into the question, shall we? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of our questions actually related to this idea of like um, casting a wide net or, you know, audience growth. So when we get there, I will try to draw that bridge for you guys, but we'll go ahead and just hop into the first question. And um here it is. So, hi guys. I wonder if I should pay for Twitter Blue to get verified checkmark. I have about a thousand followers, mostly for my writing for different pages. In old Twitter before Elon, I would not have bothered to apply because it would have felt kind of overblown. Fair enough. Uh, but now Twitter seems to push its subscription in the process, and in the process, serious creators might be forced to get blue, both for virtue signaling purposes and new features. What's your take? Cheers. And this comes from Helen. So, um, Jonas, do you want to go ahead and take this question? Sure. Uh, happy to take it. So, I guess there's there's a few takes I have. One, uh, the relevance of your Twitter account and how um, official it, I guess, really depends on the type of content category you're in. So, while you said <coughs> for your writing on different pages, I guess, depending on the type of content, Twitter can be more or less relevant for you. If it's more on the technical domain, maybe Twitter might be one of your main channels. So, uh, this is kind of hard to judge from here. But I would say overall, Twitter is a nice channel to have and also one where you as a creator are very approachable if you keep your DMs open and it just has a very nice, I feel, interactive culture. It's much easier to get into contact with verified big accounts on Twitter than it is, for example, on Instagram. And therefore, I would say overall, uh, stick to Twitter and certainly make uh, make use of it. Then in terms of the verified batch, I guess it still adds some form of authority. And I've noticed this myself recently. I mean, more and more accounts that have the batch pop up. And it still does something uh, to you as a reader when you see this little check mark. Um, I don't know if this may fade out over time because people get used to people just buying their check mark. But I feel it still adds some authority to it. And maybe especially when you have a low follower count or a somewhat low follower count uh, still at this time, then uh, this helps to add credibility to your account and helps you grow faster. Whereas when you have many followers and uh, a check mark, maybe that's when um, the real authority basically benefit kicks in. And um, yeah, I do think that this, I mean, it has the element of social signaling in cloud. Um, that this is highly relevant and obviously I don't know your financial situation but looking at Twitter Blue and its pricing it seems somewhat reasonable you could argue it's too much for just a 50% ad reduction so on and so forth we what all is it? don't really eight a month know. eight a month and eight seven month. if you bill it annually um, and so I guess compared to six, many of the other subscriptions six if you, you call might, Elon daddy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i guess compared to many other subscriptions that you might have running uh, like spotify prime netflix you name it um i guess it's a fair price and can be considered a bit of an investment in your creator status so therefore i would say it's not wasted money and you can certainly do it but whether it's a necessity Maybe a little question mark on my end. I don't know how would you see that, Thomas? You're laughing. Yeah, I can. I I can jump in because I was a bit curious when I when I read the question, and I actually did some did some research because what I was interested in is to find out if there is like any measurable impact on your account's performance when you're verified. And I didn't find any study that suggested this would be the case. I also found, that, to to be honest, I didn't find studies to the contrary. But it seems like nobody I really was researched. Say, did you even find a study that would no. even look at this topic? No, the only study that I found that seems really relevant is one that uh, uh, actually uh, contradicts a bit what, what you have been saying from your experience because like there was a study and it is from, I believe, uh, 2019 and it 
says, does being verified make you more credible? Account verification's effect on tweet credibility. And in this study, the authors did something interesting. They distinguish between authenticity and credibility. And look, if you if tweets from a verified account, and that is pre all the pay to be verified. It was still back in the days when people were just verified after they hit some criteria. Yeah. So pre Elon and and even back then so so there was no evidence so no statistic statistically significant uh, impact on the credibility of the accounts and their tweets of course their authenticity benefited from it but not the credibility of the content of the yeah. tweets i will share the link to the study in the show notes but it's like I the th only si scientific uh, uh, study that i found thomas i think so we have an American and two Germans. For me, that's a statistically significant demographic that we can quickly survey. Like, I think if you see that somebody has a, a check mark and then you consciously think, oh, wait, that's purchasable now, they probably just bought it. You're then going to be like, all right, I'm actually going to be like adverse to it. I'm actually going to kind of be weird, more weary of it. Skeptical, exactly. But I think. Most people, they subconsciously see that check mark, and it's like the remnant effect of what it used to be is still preying on you. Unless you, as I mentioned, unless you actively or consciously think, oh, wait, that's paid now. And that, that's what I think. I mean, just like, you know, ask the three of I us mean, here. What did you say? Like, when you first see it, it catches your eye, and you read that tweet before you read others? Well, I would... I will I will let you look at the way they set up they set up the study I I did a look it's based on surveys one with like a, a, a bit of more than 700 and the second one with 2200 something users as an as an n and and I mean the counter argument could be that as Anyways, Twitter caters, like Jonas alluded to, to a very specific audience, right? Like you have a lot of journalists, writers, and probably the, the active Twitter user base is by definition a bit more skeptical, a bit more an informed and media savvy yeah. than users on other platforms, which could, could play, play into this as well. But, but one question you hypothesis. just said, 700 and 2,500, that was study participants or the followers of said account that was looked at? No, no, study participants, survey participants. Okay. They did two surveys that built on, on one another to but, find, find out more. But about guys, to, to, to bring it back around to Helen's question, yeah, um, she so for her, she doesn't have to look at Tom's study. She doesn't have to even listen to Jonas. She could do her own study, sign up for it. It's eight bucks a month, six if you call Elon Dad. And boom, you do your own testing, test it for a month, three months, whatever like see how your yeah. performance goes see your growth look at your like monthly monthly user uh, uh growth rates and stuff like that and then you could you know determine on your own because it could be niche also, specific yeah. also tweet so, so views, i would guess especially uh, especially if your account is not in a high growth phase where you see like day over day like major increases in users then i there might be even an effect on just how many people have seen your tweets because the algorithm might favor tweets from verified accounts over non-verified yeah. accounts. So this is also a metric to maybe keep an eye on yeah. while doing so Based this. on whatever your KPI yeah, that is. Why is. I would, that, that is why I would so much prefer to, to have like not survey data, but actual performance data analysis where, where like many Twitter accounts are, are compared with the actual data. So that is really something that, that the people out there uh, uh, in I the think, academic community could, guess, could do. But I guess the only really relevant and insightful thing that you could do to do this or that, that would Twitter need to build, and that would be a B test this based on the same account with the same content and the same number of followers, because whenever you, I think it's squirrely. I mean, yeah, they're not going to do this, but it, yeah. whenever you do another comparison between two different accounts and so on, it, I guess it's hardly. Yeah. But Jonas, Jonas, think about it this way. Like scientifically relevant. Think about it this way. Does Twitter want to then get into the business of saying, Hey, like it's paid, it's paid to play here or when, uh, what is it called when you pay to win? Yeah, it's pay to win here. Like if win. you can you can grow faster, you can reach more people, you can be more successful on Twitter if you pay us. I don't know and if they want to you and of 
And um, of course, they're not going to do this because it could also turn out that this doesn't really add any benefit and then everybody would be like, why yeah. would I get this Dude, subscription? The conspiracy theorist in me wants to say that that, <laughs> that survey that Thomas referenced probably created by Twitter to, to make it seem like, no, 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 all users are equal, guys. It's okay. I don't know. Yeah. But, no, but I, I think... I, I think we also should distinguish, or Helen should distinguish between like the verified checkmark and Twitter blue, because like some stuff is very clearly the case. Like in replies, you're, you're positioned on top if you are a Twitter blue subscriber. So, so in these cases, you will, or in this sense, you will benefit. And there are a few other li like Twitter blue subscription benefits that might be of interest to you. But I would, uh, I, I would decide whether or not to subscribe, not based on the verification. I, I'm let's put it like this i'm not convinced that it matters too much i'm also not convinced that it doesn't matter at all but it's very unclear to me but there are some other benefits that might be of interest so so helen that is what, what i would be looking at in in your place and don't forget give it a go a give it a test yeah you might want that Yeah. And and Helen, if you if you find out some real performance improvements or other changes in your in your Twitter account behavior, let us know. Would be would be interesting to us. Yeah, I think many people would be interested in seeing some of those learnings. Um, so Helen, hope that helps. We'll move on now to question two. Thomas, this one is pretty much perfect for you. It's got your name written all over it. So question is: I used to have a food blog back in the days. And now I'd like to do something in the food slash cooking field again. I think YouTube or TikTok would be the first places people think about, but I'm really more of a writer. Blogs seem, blogs really seem to be an ancient concept. What would you recommend? We don't have a name here. Anybody else have a name on this one? No. Nameless? You know, it's a very sensitive, sen sensitive industry, food, uh, food blogging. So maybe he wants to keep his identity hidden so thomas yeah. go ahead take it away so i mean i looked at three different uh, three different aspects when i when i read this question because like so so first i was interested in the notion of like are blocks really that ancient and and uh, For, for this, I looked at a bit of data on blogging 23, and I also wanted to find out if people, like an assumption you hear and something that could be a hypothesis is do people of younger age groups, the audience that you find on TikTok, the audience that you find on, on Instagram and so on, read less. And then I also have some thoughts about food content and, and what works for, for all these and, and why you maybe say that it, that it fits so well to me. People who follow us might, might not be aware that that I uh, uh, co-authored a cookbook and I am an avid collector of cookbooks and I cook a lot and there is the, uh, yeah I, I, I follow I follow food media is is what I what I want to say so let's first Gen Z do they still read um, there is one study by the National Literacy Trust of the UK in 2019 and they sh this study showed that just 26% of under 18 spent some time each day reading. That is the lowest daily level recorded since the charity first surveyed children's reading habits in 2005. I should mention that is about book reading specifically this survey, but I think this translates to, to reading in general potentially. Uh, it also found that fewer children enjoy reading and this, that this dwindled with age. Nearly twice as many 5 to 8 year olds as 14 to 16 year olds said they took pleasure from reading. Overall, just 53% of children said they enjoyed reading very much or quite a lot. The lowest level since 2013. So, so I think that is still above 50%. Girls like reading more than boys and like in the 14 to 16 year uh, age category, it, it dips. So it's not necessarily younger generations don't read, but the people who have then mobile phones and, and TikTok maybe read a bit less, but overall reading is, is still there. And I've also seen other maybe not as reliable sources data that says like th they read more than ever because even on, on Instagram and TikTok and so on, you at least read captions. Um, 
so there are there are different data points you can find regarding reading but but on blogs specifically i was curious because of course i grew up uh, on an internet when blogs were a new thing and that was a cool thing and i started blogging i guess in 2005 or so for the for the first time when, when blogs were the new thing on the internet so, so i have an affinity for the medium but but yeah what w- what is a blog even in 2023 i mean every a website that has like dynamic content is using blogging technology. So if you define it like this, it's not this. Then back in the days, you said like it's like a diary where people write. So that nobody does this anymore as a form. And except well, may, maybe on Tumblr it still happens. Actually, there is some good data that I, that I have that that proves that people even do do this because there are like uh, uh, 518 million uh, uh, blogs on Tumblr and WordPress. Uh, hosts over 60 million blogs. That's WordPress.com in this case. And and another interesting fact, like WordPress powers over 43.2% of the internet and roughly 70 million new, new posts are published on WordPress each month. So I don't think that you can necessarily say that blogging is dead, but I also see what the, what uh, the the person is asking here because it doesn't feel as relevant of a of a medium a blog and it's just your website but then again having your own website the base for your for your content that you can monetize that is something that can be quite that can be quite relevant for you which if you fo- if you follow uh, us and our work at unify you will know that we uh, want to enable creators to do just just that and and i think the traditional notion of a of a blog and and WordPress based blogs and and so on. What, what they lack is usually in the realm of interactivity and community building, which is so important, and w- which all the platforms that people nowadays publish on social media is social by definition, and blogs are much less social, even though you have the the comments uh, than than this, and that is something, for instance, we are trying to solve for with Unify by cr- giving you your own environment that is a hybrid between publishing and community. But but now let's go to to food content. So I think you can very much still write about food. You don't need to create YouTube or Instagram content uh, about food. But but you have to do something that is very distinct. You cannot just publish recipes. The the internet is already so full with recipes uh, co- competing in there. Like how do I do like a, a BLT, a tuna sandwich, spaghetti margarita? It's boring. It's taken. You would have to be so good at SEO. Uh, uh, to to earn anything with it but but what you can do like there are two examples and i guess you are aware of them if you are in into food there is a guy called kenji lopez alt he was the writer that made serious eats like a stand out site in on the food internet and now he's doing his own stuff on on youtube super successfully and he took like a scientific mindset he is a scientist um to food and really researched so so here you can read then like if if in his books it's like eight pages about cooking hard-boiled eggs and like his experiments uh, uh how he went about it how proteins behave in, in in these eggs at different temperatures and so on and so forth and that is a way of course this niche is now already taken but that is one way how you could do it another person who came to mind is like priya krishna she she wrote this cookbook indian ish is also on the bon appetit the the american uh, food website roster quite quite popular there and she with indian ish she uh, spoke about like authentic Indian cuisine cooked with the ingredients available in the United States as an immigrant family. And that is something that leans itself also as, as a niche where you can, where you can dig in and, and create something in the written form. And then of course, like even if you publish on a blog, you probably want to have good looking pictures. You want to have good looking, uh, uh, videos from time to time or at least throw throw this in but having a, a, a base if you do like in-depth stuff for an audience and a niche that wants to be educated and if you're good at educating and uh, if you are good at writing obviously these are the the prerequisites then i think you can you can still do it and maybe instead of doing it in a traditional blog you might want to try like a, a bit more interactive thing like what you can do with unify What's your take? I mean, you are also you like cooking, both of you guys. So, 
both sons of chefs also. That's true. All of us are. Actually. If you will. Yeah. Ron Why is are you, you muted, are, by the way? Uh, Ron, can't hear you. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, I don't know if my dad would call himself a chef. He's a restaurant owner. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, descendants of, of uh, people in, in food. But Thomas, I was going to ask you a question that kind of like steers you into a direction because this person didn't give us too much context. They didn't necessarily say like, hey, I'm like, uh, you know, a food scientist type or, hey, I just like cooking or like, for example, you named a couple of a couple of pretty food intensive chefs or like food personalities while on the other side of the coin where you have people who have kind of combined like pop culture with food where you have a guy like uh binging with babish i'm sure you've heard of him thomas where he essentially started he became big by recreating dishes that would appear in movies and tv so it'd be like an episode of seinfeld where he'd order like a chicken parm and then he'd create that chicken parm so he kind of like he didn't take this and I'm sorry, this is the wrong word to use, but he didn't take like a pretentious approach to food. We're like, oh, well, I'm going to find out how many molecules a boiled egg has or that. That's great for some people. But I think if you do want to hit like the widest audience and cast the widest net and be more of like an entertainer, then maybe something like that could be for you. Like, dude, the other day I was sitting in my living room and my wife was watching um, a YouTube channel of a woman who sits in front of the camera she does her makeup while talking about true crime just a random true crime story each episode and she just does her makeup for like 35 40 minutes and my wife is like taking notes that's how into the into the channel she is so maybe there's something like that right. with cooking right where you combine kind of two you don't like writing maybe you do something where you're cooking and with voiceover, you don't even have to do it live. You could just talk about, I don't know, true crime, fantasy football, doesn't matter. Combine yeah, but this question formats. comes from, yeah. a, from a writer explicitly, but you are absolutely right. These formats yeah. also lend itself. But, but I mean, the, the first format you mentioned, too, I think you could even have like a writing format with this because it is quite nerdy. No, I think writing works probably that's a, that's a, a, a rough thing, not super accurate, but writing on the internet works if you can cater to some kind of nerdy niche somewhere. Yeah, that's like and like the real food aficionados, like the average person that cares about cooking once in a while is probably going to look up a recipe yeah. and maybe even watch a short YouTube video about it, how to do it properly. But then if you want to really get into the meat of it and find out about the like nuances, then maybe writing yeah. is your preferred. If you want to learn, if you want category. to learn, you read. That is something people still still do and and i guess like food people uh, uh, movie people that are also a bit interested in food would maybe read something like this as well but yeah uh, i think i think there are ways to to go about it jonas any and i mean yeah. also one one huge uh, category of food content that we just omitted entirely in this category is the entire uh, health nutrition uh, gains uh, sector oh, yeah. which is probably by now like 30% of food con like content on the That's internet so but it's like specifically about like training yeah. performance all of this yeah. um, maybe then it's an entirely different conversation again for uh, compared to talking about like enjoyable dinner food content oh yeah, yeah I just think so about true. who the biggest who the biggest youtubers are in like the food space and Kenji Kenji launched his YouTube channel maybe like two or three years ago. And he's seen some rapid growth. He already had an existing following, so who knows? But there are much bigger YouTubers than him. They've been doing it longer, understandably. But it's because it, it seems like when it comes to video, and again, Thomas, you're right. Like this person said they're a writer, so maybe this might not apply to them specifically. But if you're trying to like combine pop culture with food and you want to you wanna reach like a bigger audience, you kind of do have to like combine something with food um and not make it you know food sciencey or pretentious that's just my thoughts it's it tends to be the guys that are a little more entertaining that become pretty big especially on mediums like youtube tiktok stuff like that so yeah i think that i think that was great that was probably the the, the most in-depth research any of us has done good job thomas kudos um and we'll move on to question three which i think i'm going to take this one um, and it's from Michael. He's a crypto writer. 
So I've written about crypto for a long time. I've mostly published in different publications and a bit on my own medium. But crypto publishers don't pay well and the current market climate doesn't help. Now I wonder how I can progress my, in my writing career. I would like to continue to write about crypto, about the crypto market, but I also need to earn money. As my favorite work is fundamental analysis of these projects, I have already thought about going on Substack, and now I also found your Unify, which looks interesting. But here's the thing, I only have a bit more than a thousand followers on Twitter and a few hundred on my Medium. I don't think that I can go paid with that little reach. What would you recommend? So this was, I think, a, a fantastic question because it ties into kind of what we've been talking about, especially in our last couple of episodes. And I want to start by addressing Michael with, um, I'm sure you might have heard of this already, but Kevin Kelly wrote an article back in like 2008, and the name of it was A Thousand True Fans. Um, it's been talked about by other by other writers like Seth Godin, um, uh, Noah Kagan, and stuff like that. Like tons of online creators talk about this. Tons of people in the creator economy talk talk about this. It's just, it's and the premise of A Thousand True Fans is that you don't have to attract millions of followers to build a sustainable career. And Kelly argued that all you need is a thousand true fans to make a comfortable living as a creative. So the way she says, says it is that it's simple economics. If a thousand people spend a hundred dollars a year on you, a hundred, a hundred dollars on you every year, you've just earned a hundred thousand dollars, right? So a thousand fans, hundred dollars, it's a hundred thousand a year. So essentially, I mean, I mean, what does that mean? Right? So it's, you don't need, volume to be successful online and to actually make a living out of your content you really just need like a thousand true fans that are willing to spend money on you so so if i were you i wouldn't look at this like i only have a thousand followers i think you can do like a qualitative analysis of your followers and see like how many of them are like true fans of yours like true grit they will follow you whatever platform you go to and they will consume your content and they might even be willing to pay for it and i know that in your question you mentioned that um, you do fundamental analysis on projects. So to me, that's like a super high value, high leverage type of content that you can charge for from day one, even if you had zero followers. Assuming your fundamental fundamental analysis was sound and that you use good best practices and you can like justify a lot of your analysis and justify a lot of your conclusions, then there's no reason why you can't charge you know, from day one for that kind of stuff. And I, and I think that's like for, for other people listening who might be in a similar situation, the, like the fundamental, the fundamental theme here is that educational and high leverage content, you can monetize much earlier than entertaining and kind of low leverage, like prank videos and stuff like that. And most of the time, those types of content can only really be monetized in at least early on, pretty indirect ways, like here's a product that I'm sponsored by, or, hey, I want to shout out this company that's sponsoring this video. While if you're somebody who does, does like high leverage and educational content like yourself, who does um, fundamental, fundamental analysis, um, you can pretty much charge for that content. So that's one of like the, the key differentiating factors. And I think, you know, you're, you're at a super, and again, we, I mentioned this in the last episode, this unfair advantage, right? Like how many crypto writers can truly do good fundamental analysis on, on um, whether it's companies, stocks, crypto projects, whatever the case may be, that's a super valuable high leverage skill, something that you can monetize early on. So as I mentioned, just to kind of pack it up, kind of going on, on a rant here, um, do a qualitative analysis of your existing audience. If they are true fans or however many of them are, That'll give you a little more guidance on how you can monetize. And I would say just um, create like two different types of product lines. Start start with two. You can then expand it. Start with one free content format where it's free fundamental, fundamental analysis on maybe one project or something. And your paid product line is you get two or three plus additional analysis or something like that. Like create like, like a gated paid version that's a little more in-depth, a little more... Uh, yeah, a little more co comprehensive or complex, whatever you want to call it. So those would be like my my, my tips. I know Thomas might be chomping at, chomping at the bit here to get in. Thomas, you have something to add to that? 
I couldn't agree more. I think the the one example that I could add to to this that I think really fits the the bill here and underscores what you've been saying is like like Ben Thompson, the guy who founded Stratechery. Many of you will know it. I talked about it before. Like like he famously when he started to to his blog, he went with a paid concept from the get-go he did it exactly as you mentioned there's like one free article a week that is published that is his main uh, uh, marketing tool to attract audiences it's also the longest one the most in-depth but then he has like the daily update where he analyzes tech news events and he has like i think now three back in the days four emails that subscribers did get and and a few years ago he was invited to to code conference and there he said like i felt i had insight to offer that people would find valuable and that was also his reasoning for for saying i start with a paid option and i and i fully agree like if you do something that is of value to people it also sets the expectations of your of your audience that you are not here uh, uh, asking value. for donations but you are selling something because you create a product and something that is of high value but i i would like to add one thing like like when ben started out he uh, uh, had he was living in or is still living in Taiwan and he was in a in a life situation where where he could afford to to build this up over time because like if you do it especially with a subscription business model that was my uh, assumption that that is the the first thing most people would think about because it's the most common then of course you need to deliver right if you start selling subs then you also need to deliver your product to your to your audience and writing like this analysis stuff i've done it myself quite a quite a lot it takes time and and it is intense so if you have like a thousand subscribers that give you 10 buck, bucks a month then you are then you are good anyways but say if from your 1000 you can initially uh, because it turns out only 100 are, are true fans then probably you might be depending on where you live struggling with what you make but still you have to commit m most of your time into into delivering so what you should have in mind is you need the runway to build this up if you're betting on yourself like this and or an alternative something something that we for instance want to enable with unify because we we know this downside of subscription not to mention the downside for users who, who also need to commit to paying a subscription is go the micropayment way right like like have something on offer and people can unlock analysis whenever you publish it uh, uh, and pay for this individually for instance with your with your creator token, but can also be done in different ways. That would probably be an alternative path to take, depending on what your runway is and your commitment to output. And I would maybe have a, a very concrete tip or suggestion for you. I've been uh, publishing content in the Coin Monks publication on Medium previously, and I can't. I uh, try to pull it up on Twitter from my DMs, but he basically founded a little company that does uh, yeah, copywriting for different s stakeholders in the crypto industry. Uh, I even had two, two or three gigs there. And he also has a Telegram group, which is called uh, CoinMonks Crypto Writers. And there's a bunch of people that face similar uh, challenges that you do. So um, that is one tip that I could give you. Maybe reach out to those guys. Uh, the guy that runs the publication, his name is Gaurav Agravai, but yeah, CoinMonks, you will you will find it and maybe just uh, also get in touch with those guys um, can't hurt. Yeah. But I think generally, again, just to do a, a little more concrete stuff. Um, I think you're doing the right thing by collabing and finding people who already have existing audiences, getting your name in front of them. I think continuing to do that is important, but you do need to create some type of um, some type of honeycomb where you can catch users. You can send users to your own, your own website, your own, it could even be a link tree that leads to a, maybe a unified platform where you do have premium content. You just need a way that you can capture users so that you can, I mean, not just make money from them and generate more, you know, revenue from the users, but also like to tap into them for insights on what types of content they want. You need some type of communication stream with them that exceeds yeah. just looking at metrics. You know, you need to be able to ask them directly, hey, you know, what type of fundamental analysis do you guys see as valuable or what types of projects do you want me to, to, to dive deep in? I think the yeah. more 
yeah, the more open communication streams you can offer to the user, the more likely they'll be willing to pay you for that. So it's just yeah, another. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think it's super well, important because like the, the audience that you are catering to is also quite specific, right? Like your, your topic uh, uh, that you that you're writing about. And so, and so as they are also, you're, you're paying customers, you definitely want th their opinion that take, you need to know what they want to know. You probably also, I mean, like, like it's fair to assume that you are not the smartest about all of the things. So if you can manage to, to include the, the knowledge of your audience and they will be knowledgeable about something subjects because they are probably investors right they are interested in this they are probably venture capital uh, uh, people or maybe even on the regulatory side and, and working at regulators and so you can learn from all these and this makes your product in the end much better so another reason yeah. to to really don't take a, a i'm a sender approach but take a, i'm a i'm a host and i think I, i'm a good analyst but but i collaborate with my with my audience yeah. to to create the most well you possible for them yeah i mean one one other example just to to, to bring it a little more broad um fantasy football analysts a lot of what they do i mean you know they sell these premium draft kits or these premium communities where you can get tips on fantasy football directly from them and a lot of what they do like they have these subscriptions to data aggregators and they basically just provide you with tips based on some of the data that you just might not have access to. So simply just like advertising to your to your readers, let's say you're, you talk more to, um, rather than institutional investors, you're talking more to, to traders, like, you know, normal people like myself. Um, these people who may, might not have access to data aggregators and like hard data. So if you're somebody who can just like take that and convey it in a very like layman way to your to your users, that's value in and of itself. You know, these are people that don't have access to those aggregators, to those services. So you're, you're essentially just like a middleman. And I think even just that as like a, a starting place, you know, that can, that can pay dividends, but anything else guys? I wouldn't have more, uh, nothing else to add to the third question. Small growth the, hack, uh, small growth hack. Sorry, yeah. Jonas, just real quick. Go ahead. Um, when you do start to get users to come to your honeycomb and they're paying, implementing some type of uh, recruit a friend or bounty program or affiliate program is just a nice way where you incentivize your existing users to bring people with them, bring their friends, especially in crypto, where if somebody invests in something, they usually want everyone around them to invest in it. So there's kind of this community tribal effect already embedded into crypto. So if you embed something like that within your business, I think it'll it, it'll it'll help you tenfold. So just one more thing. And, All right, anyone else? And, and so, as Michael already mentions in his question that that he stumbled upon Unify and and finds it interesting, uh, allow me to mention that that what you describe run is super easy to do by the way so so if especially if you use uh, creator tokens as a means to monetize then you can just reward people who invite friends successfully with more tokens yeah. that gives them access to more content and so on so i guess that is something you can super super easily build with us so that's just a little bit of marketing and plugging our own stuff yeah as i mean it's, it's also just here. it's also just extremely true it is very easy and very simple to set up a couple of clicks. So yeah, guys, um, if any, if nobody has anything, Jonas, I cut you off a little earlier. Were you, were you going to bring up something? No, I was going to say, uh, thanks to Michael for this question. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, keep Michael. The, keep Thank them you coming. Too. And so, so I have like like one general advice for people who sent in their their questions. The more context you give us, the more specific you make it, the the better or the easier it becomes for us to to answer your questions with precision. So so yeah, don't yeah. don't be scared to write a few paragraphs of text. We will read them and we will take it into consideration when when answering your stuff. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, well, guys. Thank you for joining me again. I think it was a, this was a really good episode. I can tell that we're getting pretty good at this. Um, the flow is getting better. 
I like the intro. We talked about it in the last episode. We we're experimenting with intros. I, I, I like the flow we got into from that. Um, yeah, for anybody still here with us in this episode, please give the podcast a rating. Give it a like, give it a share, whatever mechanism for showing appreciation exists on that platform. Please smash it, as they would say. Yeah, use it. Five stars, it. five stars. This, because five this stars. really helps us to, to find new people who listen to it, to answer more questions, build more of a community. And I yeah. guess that's what, that's what we need to keep yeah. this one here interesting. Definitely. So, guys, thanks for joining me, and we'll see you guys next week. Hey.